All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get the ball rolling. Uh, my name is Jerry Conley. I'm with Seward Equipment Company. Sorry for those that you had to hear a little bit of our internal discussions. We usually can block that out, but for some reason this time we couldn't. Um, good uh, PE, DOE, DOH proof seminar this morning, air control and liquid transmission systems. Bill Painter from ARI will be presenting. I'll uh, give a little more of a formal introduction in a minute. Uh, so my first comment is it's, it's good to see that some of New York State is getting back to business a little bit. We here at Seward Equipment Company are probably half staff in the office. The other half staff are still at home working fine. Um, you know, I think regardless of what the state says or our governor says, I think, um, you know, people are going to see other people uh, and are going to be able to congregate with other people when they're ready, regardless of what a government entity says. So we think that uh, providing the ability to pick up a professional engineering credit here and there is still going to be important probably throughout the rest of the year. So we're going to try to continue these seminars every Tuesday for the foreseeable future. We're starting to run a little low on pre-approved seminars, so we're uh, starting to get other seminars into the state to get PE approval. Um, but thank you for joining us, everybody. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, during the presentation, there's going to be five multiple choice questions. I'll engage the question, read it. You click on the answer. Uh, we'll post the results, and then we move on from there. You have to answer all five questions to receive any of the credits. Again, PE, DOE, DOH, okay? That said, if you have any problems with answering the questions, because there actually have been a couple snafus in the past with a couple of individuals, um, one, try to take your screen. If you're on full screen, try to take it off of full screen. Sometimes that helps. Don't ask me why. Regardless, answer the questions even on a piece of paper, call or email Sherry McNamara, and we'll make sure that the, the answers get registered so there's no issues with your credit. Um, in addition to that, feel free to type in any of your own questions. There is a question box on the control panel. We'll monitor those and try to um, feed as many of those, those questions to Bill uh, for answer. You will need to, um, I'm sorry, I've got ahead of myself. So you have to complete the survey evaluation that will show up at the end. So please stay connected until you complete the evaluation. You will also need to download the certificate of completion and a PDF of this presentation before the webinar ends. There will, um, these will be available under the handouts drop down arrow, sorry. Again, if you miss downloading these, if there's any snafus, Sherry is the be-all end-all and she'll, she'll bail you out. Um, as a reminder, Bill uh, from ARI, he has given this presentation in New York to select engineering firms. I can't really recall which, the last two years. So some of you um, have to kind of go back and check and see if you've already taken this. So if you have and you've received the credit, then obviously you can't get the same credit for the same seminar. Our presenter today is Bill Payne from ARI. Bill's been with ARI for five years, been in the industry for 15 years. Um, he has a wealth of knowledge in this topic. Uh, everybody enjoy the webinar. I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, as you can see, guys, I appreciate everybody uh, attending this morning or this afternoon. Uh, the title of this uh, webinar is Air Control and Liquid Transmission Systems. Uh, it's basically a a broad overview or, or an air valves 101, you could call it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll just get started. Uh, typically, I, as you all can imagine, I, I do this presentation in person. And, and when I do this, I, I pose a question to the audience. And, and today, I guess with our format, it'll be a, a bit rhetorical. But uh, the question is, is a pipeline ever empty? And I get all kinds of answers and and, and funny looks and everything, but uh, the answer is a pipeline is never empty. E even if a contractor picks up a stick of pipe from a ditch to install uh, into, into a system uh, or into a pipeline, uh, there's air in that, in that pipe. And, and in any other situation, there's either liquid or air or both. 
uh, in the pipeline. Uh, if the pipe were empty, uh, be in a closed system or, or even in the example with the contractor uh, and the stick of pipe, it would be collapsed because of a vacuum. So to be truly empty, there needs to be something in the pipeline. Just, just kind of something to keep in mind when we're, we're moving forward. Uh, we'll begin with some, some uh, properties of air and water, kind of how air and water differ. Um, they don't have the same properties, or, or they have the same properties, but they react differently. Uh, the first property of which is volume. Uh, so you, you don't get caught up on the, uh, the equations and, and everything, but really what we're saying is uh, the volume of water doesn't change very much with changes in pressure or temperature but the volume of air or, or gases uh, does. So the, this graph kind of shows that, you know, as temperatures rise, the volume increases. Uh, as the temperatures decrease, obviously, it's the other way around. So you can compress air, and you really can't compress water except for the little bit of air that's inherently in water or, or wastewater. Uh, I'll point this out now. I, I tend to say water or air, uh, but, but that also applies to you know wastewater and, and gases. So they're interchangeable for the most part uh, throughout this presentation. So if you catch me saying it, don't don't stick me to it. Uh, so an air pocket, uh, you have an air pocket of any given size. You know, in this case, it says one cubic foot, but really an air pocket of any given size. If you compress that air pocket to half its size, it's a direct correlation with pressure. So you compress to half the size, you've doubled the pressure in that air pocket. Uh, now, if you you uh, you increase, or I'm sorry, you pressurize that pocket to one tenth the size, uh, you've you've multiplied the pressure by ten. So it's a direct correlation. Uh, you know, if we had clear pipes, uh, which later on in the presentation we may discuss, but if you had clear pipes, just seeing the size of the air pocket doesn't really dictate how, how much energy and how much pressure is built up in that air pocket. Sometimes the smaller ones are actually uh, the more potential for, for danger and surge and, and, and things of that nature. So another property of air and water that differs uh, is viscosity. So water has about a thousand times the viscosity of air. Um, that, that difference in viscosity affects velocity and the speed at which both media travel through the pipe. So if, uh, you know, basically what I'm saying is that air travels more quickly or has a higher velocity as it travels through uh, our pressurized systems or gravity fed uh, systems. Uh, you'll see at the bottom there, it's kind of small, but there's a, a, a traditional style impeller meter uh, and, and not picking on any, any particular manufacturer. It's just a, uh, you know, it's the, the technology impeller meters, but uh, one real world uh, example of this, this difference in viscosity and, and its relation to velocity is uh, just in operation, you know, when we have clean water coming to our homes and the water meter is measuring flow, uh, if air comes across that impeller, the, the increase in velocity, not only will air be measured, but it'll be measured at a higher rate because of the increase in velocity over water. Uh, this is particularly a, a, an issue after a, a water line break, as obviously when the, the line breaks, you introduce quite a bit of air and create a very large air pocket all at once. Uh, you know, the repair is done, and then you start up again uh, and open the, the valve, you are introducing a lot of air to that, to that meter. Uh, another property uh, is solubility, and, and solubility is really just the the uh, ability or the capacity of water or liquid to hold an air or a gas. Uh, we all kind of tech, you know, basically agree and, and it's been said for years that you know, water has 2% air in it by nature, H2O. Uh, well, that's true at, at average temperatures and, and you know, this chart here will show you that. Uh, at about 60 or 61 degrees, that's where we see the 2%. As we raise temperatures or lower temperatures, you'll notice that the, the ability for that liquid to hold a little more or a little less air or percentage-wise of air uh, is apparent in this graph here. Uh, so that's one part of the equation, the, the temperature. But when you add in pressure, you really change 
uh, the, the property or the solubility. So again, we see at 60 degrees, we're about 2%, that's at zero PSI. As you introduce pressure, as we do with gravity and or uh, pumped you know, systems, uh, you see that you know, at 50 degrees and 100 PSI, we got almost 18%. So uh, not, nothing you need to write down or, or concentrate on, but just an illustration of, of what pressurized systems really do uh, to, to the flow or the media that's in the, uh, that's in the system. Uh, and this is just an illustration of the same. You know, on the left, we have the increase in pressure and the increase in molecules, be it air or, or gas. Uh, and on the right, it's the solubility, how it relates to, to temperature, uh, changes or decreases. And, and you might not think that there's that much temperature variance, I guess, in the system, but uh, you'd be surprised. And, and the changes in direction going through fittings, uh, deeper into the ground, you know, closer to the surface, uh, there's actually quite a bit of variance in temperature of the liquid uh, throughout a system. Uh, another property would be vapor pressure. Uh, you know, or, or the uh, ability for the media to change state, uh, in this case from liquid to gas. Uh, we can, you know, you can think of it as boiling water. Uh, and at sea level, this, this, this graph here, or this chart, I'm sorry, says uh, at sea level, we, we, uh, an atmospheric pressure is, is standard 14.7. We boil water or change the state of water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, maybe out in the Rocky Mountains or the Himalayans or, or some, some higher elevation, uh, that, that uh, temperature to boil water would be a bit lower, maybe 205 or so, uh, depends on elevation again. Uh, but in our systems, in a negative pressure situation or, or you know, vacuum or, or what we call surge, uh, we can actually boil water you know, as low as 50, 60, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's that, that rapid change and lowering of pressure uh, because of a quick valve close, a hydro, you know, quick close of a, of, of a penetrator on the line uh, can create water column separation. And, and it's actually a point where we can change the state of the media in our systems. Uh, kind of corny here, but there, there's uh, water boiling on your left because it's being subjected or introduced to temperature uh, increase from the, the burner. On the right, you'll see it's actually a, uh, a closed system, but clear window test uh, that I believe was done in Germany. Uh, and it shows a change of state in our system after the quick close of a valve. Now I have a video of this, if anybody's interested and I can share with, uh, I don't typically show it during the presentation because it's kind of grainy, but in less than a second, the water changes to gas, you know, to to uh, you know, change of state, comes back, changes state again, and, and that's what happens in our systems with the, when there's a surge. So basically it's uh, you know, multiple changes of states all happening within a fraction of a second. So the, the video I have is a, is a super slow, slow motion camera uh, that can capture that and, and there's some, some data that, that shows. But uh, this, this happens folks, it happens pretty regularly actually in our systems. And, we hear water hammer and things of that nature, but it's it's a, a pretty serious issue uh, that needs to be addressed in both water and wastewater systems. Uh, so that brings us to you know kind of a break here. We we got a, our first poll question, and, and I'll let Jerry uh, take this, please. Thanks, thanks, Bill. You can uh, you can hear me, Bill? I can, yes, sir. Um, okay, let's see. So before I read the question, just real quick, everybody, we have the ability to see who is the phrase on our our um, dashboard is non-attentive. And I assume it means maybe you have this running in the background and you're doing email or something else, which quite frankly, I don't think we really care. But the reason that we use GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar is because it's, uh, it's approved by the So the report that we give the state for your credit also shows attentiveness so excuse me if you're on for the credit just should put it back on your screen and whether you want to or not you've probably got to pay attention for 45 minutes to get your credit <coughs> excuse me sorry all right question number one water has about blank times the viscosity of air 
Okay, we're, <clears throat> I'll give you just a couple more seconds. Uh, I'll cl I think sure I have to close it, right? Um, yes. Or, did, uh, okay, so the, the, the answer is there's like 92% that said a thousand, well, there's about a thousand times the viscosity of air, you would be correct. Okay, there you go. Good. Okay. Now, I, I think what I have to hide it now, and then we're back. Yes. Now, Bill, it's you. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, it looks like most, most everybody was listening, so I'll try to, to keep you interested and keep you awake as we move on. Uh, the next section or, or, or things we're going to discuss are, are the behavior of the air in the pipeline. Uh, you know, everything we've talked about up until this point is really about dissolved air, you know, air coming out of solution um, or, or gas coming out of wastewater um, because of, of pressure changes and, and um, temperature changes. But that's not the only way that air gets into our systems. Uh, you know, as simple as loose gaskets and, and you know, open to atmosphere uh, places in our pipeline. I mean, it could be as much as deteriorated pipe or, or, uh, or again, just, you know, locations where you have fittings or, or uh, valves or hydrants that, that introduce air. Uh, but more, more uh, I guess, apparent or more frequent and more important uh, is, is at the pumping systems. You know, that's where the most air is introduced is, is at the very start. Uh, in this particular example, this is a clean water, obviously a reservoir type situation. Um, and these, uh, the, the inlet or the suction pump uh, will pull air from the surface of the lake or, or the water source uh, and, and introduce it through the pumps into the system, uh, you know, through vortices. And you can see it kind of a little graph or a little uh, drawing of it there on the left. Uh, that's clean water. Uh, we also, and, and this is very apparent to, to most operators, that we introduce air at the wet well in a wastewater system. Uh, and, and, you know, we could talk about the plunging jet uh, phenomenon or scenario, but basically uh, not only is the wet well introduce air, but the, the agitation or the, uh, you know, the drop from the inlet, uh, I'm sorry, the outlet of the, uh, the collection system uh, introduces air from from uh, you know water being poured into the wet well. So once the air is into the system, we we will talk next you know a little bit about how the, the air pockets themselves form, uh, and we all know kind of inherently uh, the air pockets form at the high points, and this is because of a lot of the uh, the, the you know factors or the uh, the things the properties I guess we talked about in the first section, uh, but air travels more quickly and it's going to travel to the high point. Uh, if there's no relative high point in a, in a pipeline, uh, those air pockets will form at the crown of the pipe. Uh, there's no such thing as, as flat pipe, but uh, we're talking relatively flat where there's no you know, high point. Um, so at that high point or at that wherever the air pocket might be, uh, you have a restriction in flow. You know, so it's, it, it's a restriction in flow, but it creates an increase in velocity. You know, think about a thumb over a garden hose, you know, it's a, it's a way to increase flow um, from the tip of the hose. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit, and, and I won't go into it too much because it's a whole subject on its own, but we'll talk about critical velocity after this few slides. Uh, but basically what, what we're saying is that, you know, there's that increase in velocity might move the air pocket, you know, away from that high point, but it's not enough to completely take it downstream or upstream dependent on, on the profile of the pipe. Uh, what tends to happen is that air pocket is smeared from that high point down the downstream side of the high point. So basically you create a long, you know, section of pipe that has a, a, a air pocket uh, along the crown. Uh, and here, I guess, I guess I included it and I didn't think I did, but uh, this, and again, these graphs and things are just here for, for uh, backup, but they're not anything you need to, to focus too much on. But uh, basically critical velocity uh, is the ability for the flow to take either small air bubbles or, or air pockets with the flow, you know, uh, and, and remove it from the high point. So it's the ability for the media to take air along with the stream. Uh, this particular graph is showing, you know, the feet per second, which is, is how critical velocity is measured, uh, and the diameter of the pipe 
and, and the slope of the pipe. So it's just saying for small bubbles, not air pockets, but just air that might come out of solution or is being introduced at the pumps, uh, you know, what, what, the, uh, what you need to get them moving downstream. But this is a better example or, or uh, a way of explaining what's really going on. Uh, and it might be tough to tell from the, the, the perspective, I guess, but this clear pipe that I, I talked about earlier that was a, a test in Germany, it's, it's sloped towards us. You know, as you, as you, you know, look at the picture, it's coming downstream towards you. So the critical velocity in this case is moving, it's high enough, the critical velocity, to move those small air bubbles with the flow. And, that, and, and that'll be dependent on many things. And again, that's a whole, you know, we could spend hours just discussing uh, critical velocity. But as those small air bubbles consolidate and create an air pocket, that air pocket is, is too uh, buoyant and, and, you know, we'll talk all about, uh, or we won't, but uh, there's things such as drag and surface tension, things that the lining of the pipe and things of that nature that affect this. But basically the critical velocity isn't high enough to move the air pocket. It'll continue to move the small air bubbles, but that air pocket will fight its way back up to the high point. Uh, it's not as simple as this. Obviously, there's there's a lot of turbulence from, especially in wastewater systems where the pumps are continually coming on and off, and and even in clean water systems where you know we're we're, uh, we're closing and opening valves and whatnot. But that air pocket that's moving upstream and that turbulence that's happening in our systems tends to tear small air bubbles uh, from the air pocket. And again, they're they're uh, the critical velocity is such that it takes takes those air bubbles with it. Uh, the liquid takes it with it downstream and it will create more air bubbles, or I'm sorry, more air pockets. So it's a continuous thing. Even in a closed system where the pumps don't turn off, uh, i.e. a clean water system, we're continually introducing air through the pumps. We're continually introducing air that's coming out of solution. So throughout the system, uh, even when the pumps stay on, we're creating all these air pockets. Uh, so this is a, a better perspective of, of what's going on, and, and this is the air, the larger air pocket headed upstream. Uh, you see all the smaller air bubbles that are tearing away from it, and it might just be, you know, moving with the flow. Uh, but that's what's really going on in the system. Again, we don't have clear pipes, so typically we can't see what's going on. Uh, but this is your opportunity. And you know, in the in the high point. Uh, animation or, or drawings I showed you, it was a very exaggerated high point. You know, we tend to think that, you know, river crossings and, and big changes in elevation are where we have trouble. And that's where we, we put air valves or standpipes or whatever solution we come up with to, to alleviate the air. But really, air pockets need very little change in elevation. Uh, this is, I, I don't know if this is a 22 and a half or 11 and a quarter uh, bend. Uh, and it's enough, as you can see in the system, to collect air and to create that high point, you know, create a uh, air pocket, I mean. So it doesn't take much. It doesn't need to be a river crossing or, you know, a, a, a hill. It's, uh, it can happen in, in a very slight change in direction. And again, there's other things. We don't have enough time to go over uh, this in great detail. If you're interested, I'd be happy to, to follow up with anybody who is, but, uh, the, these, this air bubble, is, you know, air bubble phenomenon and the critical velocity uh, is really the lining of the pipe is the main uh, or the biggest factor in affecting how, how that, uh, not only the liquid, but the air will flow through the system. So, you know, glass lining, Portland cement concrete lining, you know, all the P401 in a sewer system, they all have different uh, drag and surface tensions and and they affect how the air is, uh, it, it travels through the pipeline. Uh, so that brings us to our second question, and I'll turn it over to Jerry for the. Are you with me, Jerry? Okay. I think we lost him. Yeah, Jerry, I'll go ahead and do the second one. Okay. Um, there we go. Well, that's number one. Ooh, it messed up on me. Sorry. That's fine. I can read it if you like. There we go. There we go. 
When are there no relative high points in a pipeline, air pockets will form where? Okay, we're about almost 90%. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds. Okay, close it. And the answer is, sorry, C, at the crown of the pipe. Great job, everyone. Um, now it's back to you, Bill. Great, thank you. Let's see if I, there we go. Okay, so now we're going to talk what, you know, why do we need to get rid of the air? What's, what's it, a, is it a big deal to have the air? You know, obviously we talked about the restriction in flow and increase in velocity. Uh, you know, first thing people think about is maybe that, that affects the, the pressure that, you know, especially in a clean water system where you need to maintain a certain pressure, but that's really not the issue. Uh, the, the biggest issue, like many things, is money. So, you know, if you have a restriction in flow, you, you, you're, you have more head, you know, so your pumps are going to have to work harder to, uh, to pump what, what, you know, to stay on the pump curve with the initial design. Um, so whether it be electricity or, or diesel or whatever, whatever fuel source or, or uh, cost, uh, you know, cost to, to operate and to create energy, uh, that's what we're discussing. Uh, this is just a short, quick example of a, of a system uh, in Texas. Uh, this is a wastewater system that uh, basically uh, we were contacted years ago about uh, some issues that, that this particular municipality was having with, with low flow and long pump run times. So they, they, um, they contacted our local representative and, and uh, you know, and thought maybe it was because of air and and we thought we would take a look at it. So basically, they, we asked for SCADA system data, you know, on the pumps for, you know, a couple months prior to, uh, you know, when they had contacted us, and, uh, and this is what they provided. So a little tough to see, I apologize, but uh, basically uh, I'll point out that uh, the flow, you know, the, the gallons per minute are in the 200 to 300 range. Uh, you know, we don't know all the particulars of their pumping systems, and, and I'll touch on that in a minute, but uh, we'll see the pump run times. These are one hour segments uh, on the bottom. Uh, you know, there's pump run times at 15 minutes up to, you know, 45 minutes at times, which uh, regardless of the scenario on the, you know, at the pumps, that, that, that's a pretty telltale sign that there were some issues. So basically low flow, uh, long, long time that the pumps had to run to, to successfully move the wastewater. Uh, we, we actually, they replaced two, they had five locations where they had air valves. We don't know the condition of the, of the air valves, what brand or make or model, and to be honest, we don't really care. Uh, but there was five manholes, you know, buried uh, locations that they had air valves. So that was an opportunity to, you know, to alleviate the air at certain parts of the system. So. Uh, I think what had happened at the time is they decided on the two most likely spots for the most amount of air that it would accumulate uh, by a, an analysis, and they replaced those two uh, air valves. Uh, so you'll notice where the change out happened. Um, I don't know what the, the time of day, but uh, you'll see up above, that's where the change out happened. And then afterwards, you see the flow rates. And now the flow rates are completely up and off the charts. Uh, we'll look at the pump run times, obviously much lower, hard to tell, maybe uh, under five minutes most of the time. Uh, for those of you that, that deal with pumps or, or in the design side of things, then you'll probably notice that this isn't a good scenario either. So th they went from one side of the pump curve to the other, uh, you know, and obviously this is a, a, a candidate for cavitation and other issues that it would result. Uh, we were not made aware that <laughs> because of their low flow and, and long pump run times over the course of about 12 years, they had two major pump upgrades. Uh, you know, I don't know if the, the pump manufacturer is just looking to, 
you know, obviously we're in a, a society where you you know you're 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 selling a product and you're you're trying to make money. So uh, at the time, instead of addressing the issue correctly, it seems that they just upgraded their pumps. Uh, so what happened is now when we get rid of the air and, and reduce back to to where the uh, you know where they should have been from the design aspect, uh, now their pumps are oversized and overpowered. Just something I wanted to point out to you there. So so with air being alleviated, you can see the efficiency, the energy savings potential. Uh, I have a whole presentation I can provide or or, uh, or do for anybody who's interested, but. Uh, we find that a minimum of 15 and is up upwards to 25% energy savings uh, with when you alleviate all the air out of the system. Uh, another reason to get rid of air is for corrosion protection. So you know, for for corrosion to even occur, you need three things. You, you need a corrosive material, you know, i.e., ductile iron, you know, concrete, steel reinforced concrete. Uh, you need air or gas and you need liquid or water. Uh, if you eliminate any one of those three things, then you don't have corrosion. I know it sounds simple and corny, but uh, that's the case. So basically what we're saying is if the pipe is full, then, you know, and there's no air, it's only liquid in the system, and whatever little bit of air that's inherently in the liquid, then you won't have the corrosion. Uh, this is kind of a cross section of what, what tends to happen in a wastewater pipe. Uh, but if, if you're running, you know, open channel, as we call it, on the downward side, even in a pressurized system or, or certainly in a gravity system, uh, we tend to not be, you know, tend not to have a full pipe. And then obviously where we have air pockets would be another reason to not have a full pipe. But you'll see here that, the, oh, I, okay. So the, uh, the flow line is the, is the blue line there across the middle. And, and you don't have to concentrate on any of the H2S, you know, jargon, but uh, basically, the the flow line and below, all the lining of the pipe is intact. Uh, there's no issue, again, because there's not any air or gas. Uh, but above the flow line, you know, right at that flow line is, is, a, is one of the areas that really sees corrosion, as is the crown of the pipe, because that H2S, just like we talked about, air and gas, they, they rise to, this, to the crown. Uh, so that's that's kind of how it breaks down. And I'm sure that many of us, me included, have been on job sites where, you know, ductile iron pipe, you can take a screwdriver. It might not even look uh, like it's, you know, sometimes it's it's Swiss cheese and you can see that it's deteriorated. And other times it's just, uh, you know, it's, it looks intact, but you can take a, a, a pencil or a screwdriver and jab, you know, jab it into the crown of the pipe. Uh, and obviously we, we all go to trade shows and, and uh, you know, corrosion and, and manholes and in piping systems is a, is a big subject. Uh, we borrowed this from a, a show that we were at uh, years ago, uh, but they had some really good, you know, real world uh, illustrations of what we just described. So you see the, the flow line and a lot of deterioration on the, you know, just above the flow line. Uh, on the crown, all the uh, deterioration there, that's all what you see in the bottom of the pipe that's fallen from the crown. But notice the the, the uh, concrete lining in this it's ductile iron pipe, but the concrete lining is still intact under the flow line. Uh, another example, concrete pipe, uh, <laughs> a little worse. Uh, this is an above ground application, so obviously there's interior and exterior factors at play. Uh, but we, we just still see flow, so I guess technically the the flow still, you know, the the system's still operating to some extent, but. Uh, we've all seen this, and these are just some examples of that. So that brings us to our third poll question. And I'll, I don't know if Jerry's there or Sherry, or if I need to do so. Um, I'll be doing it. Okay. What elements are necessary for corrosion to occur? And just a reminder that if you have a problem answering, just um, send me your answer. You can do it through the chat or the questions or whatever, and I'll just change it on the report. Okay, we'll give you guys just a couple more seconds. We got about 80% voted. Okay, well, a couple more coming in. 
Okay, I'm closing it now. And the answer was D. Good job, everybody. And now it's back to you, Bill. Thank you. All right, so what do we do to get rid of the air? We talked about the reasons why we want to. Uh, you know, the Romans knew that, that even in their, their aqueducts and water transfer that they needed to put holes in the top of their pipes. Uh, you know, kind of think of the, the gas can scenario. You need to have a vent to get, uh, you know, proper flow and, and full efficiency. Uh, you know, that, that's a great solution. And, and even a standpipe, I, I know there's some even famous architecturally standpipes around the United States, but uh, typically a standpipe is, is it, well, number one, it's the best air valve that there is, but it's not feasible often because of the height that it needs to be to be above the hydraulic grade line. Uh, and then location. So depending on location, it could be in somebody's front yard and, and just not be feasible. So decades ago, or almost uh, you know pre World War One, uh, this air valve technology was was invented. And no matter what air valve manufacturer you're discussing, be it a traditional or a modern, there's three types of air valves. Uh, we tend in our industry to say air release valve when we're we're asking about air valves. Uh, but air release is, is, is kind of a misconception because number one, air release is only one type of air valve. Uh, and number two, air valves do more than just release air. They control the flow as we've discussed. Uh, so let's talk about these three types. The first type is an air and back valve and it's a large orifice valve. Uh, the traditional style had, you know, has a, typically has the same inlet as outlet. Uh, and the purpose of this valve is to let a lot of air in, I'm sorry, uh, a lot of air out when you're filling the pipeline and let a lot of air back in for vacuum protection when the pump shut off or you have a, a power failure. Uh, so you notice it's a, it's a stainless steel ball. Uh, that stainless steel ball rises to contact a hydrometer rubber seal. The reason that that rubber seal is hydrometer or hard rubber is because it's got a stainless steel ball slamming into it. Uh, so, once the system is pressurized, you filled the pipe, this valve doesn't do anything until the pump shut off or, or it loses pressure. So basically it's filling and draining and that's it. Uh, and we talked about air still comes into the pipeline while you're under pressure. So that brings us to the second type of air valve and that's the air release valve. Same concept, uh, stainless steel ball, hydrometer rubber, but a very small orifice. And this releases small amounts of air while we're under pressure. Uh, so where this one you know, stops off, this one picks up. So air and back, air release. And the third type is called a combination. And a combination air valve is just what it sounds like. In this particular style, they just screw the air release into a port on the high side of the air and back. So this is a, an animation of, of filling and operation and draining of a pipeline with combination air valve. So there's all the air that's already in the system. As the flow comes, we release all the air. Both floats are closed. Uh, pressure differential, you know, air will build in the top air release valve. Pressure differential will drop the float and we'll, it leads off small amounts of air. Notice the green float or the air back float never opens until we need it to on drain. So once we go into draining or the pump shut off for any reason, we introduce air through both of the orifices, but most importantly through the larger air and back. And that's how we provide vacuum protection so we do not collapse the pipe. These are some uh, you know, traditional air, uh, clean water combination air valves. You notice there's not the two floats, but it's the same concept, but uh, there's, you know, a, uh, what we call a lever system. Um, all cast iron, typically, this is an air release in the middle, uh, and the three around the outer, outer edge are combination valves. So this is a, a, an animation of, of filling a pipeline without an air valve. A very simple system, obviously one pump, one high point, Pumping uphill to a, you know, to either a reservoir or a tank. So note that, that we talked about there's air in the pipe to begin with. Uh, it doesn't matter in the upper upper section of the pipe because it's open to atmosphere. So the end of the pipe almost acts as the standpipe or the air valve. 
But whenever you have a change in topography, that's that high point is where the air gets trapped. So now we have an air and vac, not a combination, but just the air and vac, and we're filling. That air pocket wouldn't even be created, but for illustration purposes, they, they do. Uh, it releases that air. It, get, it gets a, 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 a full flow. You know, whatever the designer designed the pumps to pump uh, is what we're going to get. Full flow may be a little exaggerated, but you get the point. So that was filling the pipe. So now, you know, like I said, we're under pressure. That valve, you know, the air and back valve is closed. So that, that float will not drop or do anything uh, while under pressure. So what happens, as we discussed, is that air valve's not operating anymore. It just was there to do the filling and the draining. Well, that air pocket's going to reform for all the things we discussed, all the, the air that comes in through our pumping systems, all the air that comes out of solution because of the temperature and pressure changes, and we're right back to where we started. So that air and back valve helped us fill efficiently, but now we're not flowing efficiently because we're, we're again, back, back to a... Uh, an air pocket. So you notice the necessity, I guess, for this, this air release portion. And on this particular valve, I think that, yeah, they pointed out it's a very small uh, orifice valve that's on the high side of the air and back valve. And that bleeds off the small amounts of air that need to be released while operating. So that was the filling. Now we'll talk about the draining. Same system. You know, the, we get a pump trip or, you know, uh, or an intentional shutdown, whatever the reason might be. And, and the pipe starts to drain. Now, again, on the high side of this pipeline, the, the, you know, the, there's not an issue in the higher side because the pipe is open to atmosphere. But at that high point, we create water column separation, which is a very dangerous thing that creates surge. Now, you, you, we're not going to collapse a pipe in one instance, but... You know, over over years and or months and years of upwards and downward pressure uh, variance, then you uh, you will create some some damage to the system. Now we have that air and vac valve that we discussed at the first animation. We're draining the pipe again. The high point is the issue before. Now we're introducing air to fill the void of the of what the water column separation created. So we're, we're, we're filling that void so that there's not a collapse or, or, or even just pressure, uh, again, variances. You, you know, plastic pipe, you think of a credit card and all those upwards and downwards uh, flexing over the, over the course of the life of the pipe can create some issues. Not going to happen in one, one quick surge, typically. So more um, water column separation is not just at the high points, but at the check valve after a pump. So again, single single pump system, pretty simple. Uh, you know, depending on the type of pumps and the type of check valves, we have that check valve close, cuts off the water column, and we create a surge right at the pump. So that comes back and slams into the check. Typically, it would slam back and forth repeatedly till the energy was expended. Um, but, but this again is just a simple il illustration of, of what's going on. So now we have a combination air valve at, you know, if it were multi-pump system, it'd be on the header, but on a single pump, it just needs to be after the check. We introduce air as the water column separates. As that water column returns, we expel air or release air uh, to cushion the effect of that water coming back, you know, towards the, the back side of the check valve. So that, you know, we talked about the high points and we just touched on the, the pump station valves, I guess. Uh, AWWA has a, you know, it's a, a C5112 uh, standard, uh, which now, as of a few years ago, also applies to wastewater valves. I know we tend to think of clean water with AWWA, but, but the C5112 actually covers both uh, clean water and wastewater systems. Uh, their manual M51, which I've highlighted here, uh, shows kind of what type, we talked about the three types of valves, it shows what type of valves to use where. Uh, we're not going to get too deep into this. Uh, most manufacturers uh, provide uh, a sizing and placement analysis, their own proprietary software, 
where they can identify where and when to put these or check on, on those of you that design systems, we can kind of be a, a, a last look on, on what design that, um, that you've done. Uh, you'll notice that uh, you'll see some that are air release and some are their air and back only. Typically, I'd say 99% of the time, all these could just be combination air valves. Um, there's really not much cost difference, at least in the modern valves. Um, and typically, it's not going to hurt to have air release and or air back in certain locations. Uh, you know, AWWA will say that you need a, you know, if this was a multi-pump system, let's say this is a quad system, you need one air release valve after every, uh, every pump before every check. And then you need one, like we discussed in the last animation, on the header after all the pumps come together on the discharge. So that's the co water column separation valve, and it's very important. Uh, the, the ones that are in between the pumps and the check, are, they tend to not be uh, designed that often, uh, but the purpose of those is to get rid of that, that initial air that comes through the wet well and or uh, through the pumping system that we discussed in, in an earlier conversation. So for years, the, the industry just used a clean water valve for wastewater. Uh, and as you can imagine, with the things that are in our wastewater, that just wasn't feasible, wasn't, uh, wasn't effective. So they created what, what we call a wastewater air valve. And the purpose or, or the, uh, the design change is the two float system. And what you need to is maintain this air gap. This is a, a cutaway just showing that this valve could be varying heights. But, but the important thing is that there's an air gap internally in between the two floats. And what that does is it prevents sewer and solids and things from coming up and out of the valve if there's a failure. So uh, we need this, this seal, just like the clean water valve, we need this, this stainless steel ball to, to make a, a seal up top. Um, and that, that creates an air pocket here and keeps the sewage and, and thing, grease and solids from, from getting to the top of the valve. Now, the problem with traditional valves is the shape of the valve, uh, you know, the heavy cast iron cylindrical shape. There's a very close proximity of the float to the sidewall. So if this gets gunked up and this float stops moving, it affects the top float. There's a rigid, con oh, there's a rigid connection between the two. So anything that happens to this float happens to the top float, and now you're spewing sewage. Uh, more often than not, uh, the isolation valve below it is shut off because it's leaking. Uh, here's a few. Again, they're not two floats, but they're float and hinge, you know, uh, almost a hinge system. Um, probably even less ideal as far as wastewater is concerned for all those, the small parts. Uh, I'm moving pretty quickly because I know we're getting close to the end here, so I'll, I'll uh, apologize if I'm going too fast. But uh, I borrowed this from uh, from a textbook that many of you might recognize, Metcalf and Eddy. Um, when it comes to, you know, there's very little information and, and things taught in, uh, in our schools and engineering schools about uh, wastewater air valves. Um, and what little excerpt there was in this textbook, basically, you don't have to read the whole thing, but it says, that you should avoid using air valves in wastewater systems because of the maintenance issues. Uh, you know, from these heavy traditional cast iron valves and the uh, you know ability for them to clog. He'll go on later to say that the uh, the solution is to just put a manual ball valve in a vault and have a maintenance person go into confined space and bleed off the air manually. Uh, and I don't think I need to explain why that's not not a good idea. Uh, both for the confined space and for the, the non-automatic aspect of just bleeding the air whenever you decide to send a guy out there. So, uh, you know, these traditional valves kind of got a bad rap. And that brings us to our fourth poll question. What prevents leakage in a wastewater air valve? Um, also, a reminder, you guys can go ahead and download your certificates and the PDF of this presentation in the handout section anytime. It doesn't have to be at the end. And one more little note keeping that I realized wasn't said. We are DEC and DOH approved. Um, DOH has not given me the approval number because they're not in the offices, but it has been approved. It's on their certificate that way. Um, and as soon as I get the number, I will email everybody um, who needs it. So, a few more seconds.
Okay. And the answer for this one was C, internal air pocket. So back to you, Bill. It kind of a trick question there. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, so this this next section I'm going to run through really fast is is we're we're crunched for time, but uh, we talked about the two float system and the traditional valve. Well, the modern air valve that came along, it had a different uh, solution, and it's what they call a rolling seal. Uh, and this is uh, kind of a funny little illustration, but if you think of it, the old bathtubs with the rubber stopper and, and a full tub, all the head down on that drain made it difficult to pull the, pull the plug or pull the drain. Uh, my grandmother actually did this, but she had a, a little rubber mat over the drain, uh, much easier to pull. You know, this was before the era of, of the, you know, the, the pulley systems and the, uh, the chains and everything. But uh, basically, if you were to put a washcloth or a rubber mat over the drain, when you, when you remove it, you're only removing or uncovering the drain or orifice when it pertains to air valves. You're only uncovering the orifice or covering the orifice a little bit at a time. With a stainless steel ball, you're, you're, it's all or nothing, and, and it creates a lot of force inside of the valve, and it's hard to, to seal the valve at a low pressure. So you'll see on the left, the traditional valve, very small orifice, again, the stainless steel ball. On the right is the rolling seal concept. Much larger orifice, allows more airflow, uh, allows the valve to be made out of composite materials, very lightweight, much, much smaller, obviously. This is an air release only not a combination, but you notice that the whole valve is smaller than the float on the traditional. Uh, and this is how it works. So again, this is air release. So the air that we're releasing on fill is, is insignificant in regards to what you'd really want. But the rolling seal is what we're, we're kind of looking at. So once we're pressurized and we need to release air that's built up in the system, instead of the ball going up and down and slamming the hydrometer rubber, it's a little rolling seal that curls down and releases the air. Very simple. Uh, this is a combination that does the same thing. But you'll notice there's two orifices. Uh, there's a rectangular one just above. I don't know if any, oh, I don't know if my pointer works or if anybody can see it, but there's a large rectangular orifice here and a slit here. So this is the air and vac, and this is the air release. And I'll play it again. So we're filling, we're expelling more air with the combination valve through the larger orifice. And once the, the valve is sealed, both the smaller orifice and the larger orifice are sealed. Once the, the air builds up in the top of the valve, the, the float drops and releases air just through the air release. The pressure in the valve keeps the air and back portion sealed. So same as the air release, but it's a combination and now you can get more a higher volume of air in and out on drain and fill as you could or than you could with the air release. So this is a, a, a illustrate or an air test, I should say. So I don't know if you could hear that, but basically this is an air only test on a yoke, comparing you know the rolling seal style of closure to a to a you know stainless steel ball closure. What 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 you'll see is that the basically the the stainless steel ball comes up and slams shut before there's no water in the test. So air closed the valve instead of what should have closed the valve, which is which is pressure differential and and the float with the water. So so the uh, premature closure is what we call what happened in that that uh, test. So that rolling seal applies to wastewater valves as well you know, a little different than the clean water. Uh, and I'll show you a quick one here. It's it's the same concept of having the two floats, uh, but notice a, a much the modern air valve has a much different shape and float, uh, a different shape body. All this allows more space between the float and the sidewall so that you can maintain it less often. Uh, you might hear people say that a, a modern air valve doesn't need maintenance, and that's simply not true. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is the uh, the two floats are not rigidly connected. You see the spring action there. So turbulence happens often, as we discussed, and that can create a, an issue for the bottom float. And that bottom float can, you know, if it's rigidly connected to the top one, 
it affects the seal at the top of the valve and and uh, we'll have the EPA on us for spilling spilling wastewater. So uh, just, you know, some things to point out. Uh, composite materials obviously make it lighter uh, and a lot less uh, bolts to unbolt to, to get inside and maintain it. So that, that, there's a nominal valve, I won't bother you with that one, but there's also a new technology of a direct bury unit of these same valves. Uh, and basically what this, this unit does is it takes the, the valve and puts it in its own self-contained box with a, with a isolation knife gate. Uh, and it allows the operator, the, the person maintaining the valve, to maintain it from above ground. A single person comes out, opens, you know, there's typically a traditional manhole lid above this. They take that off, they take this lid off, and a T-handle closes the isolation valve. So you've provided isolation. Now there's still pressure buildup in the valve. So in order to, to uh, remove the valve, there's a ball handle that is in the way of getting the, the T-handle onto this harness. So it's kind of a safety mechanism, but uh, no matter what air valve you're dealing with, uh, it's important to release the pressure. Once the isolation valve is closed, you need to release the pressure in the valve. So this is no different. And, uh, and it's also a safety factor to make sure that the person does it prior to removing the valve. Uh, there's also the same type of concept in clean water valves, a uh, self-isolated uh, solution. Uh, here's just a sample installation of how that would be done. I mentioned that a traditional valve or traditional uh, ring and cover would be above the self-contained unit, but it replaces a traditional concrete manhole. Uh, just a sample of, uh, you know, if we can't put it in the street, you, you put it on a uh, on an offset. Uh, and that, this is just, a, you know, kind of a, a guide to, to how much riser you need and what, what angle the riser. One, one quick thing I'll point out is, uh, you know, we tend to see especially smaller two-inch valves be installed on, on tapping saddles, you know, just threaded. Uh, a good practice is to actually put the valve on a T. And the idea is that, you know, that air that's traveling across the crown of the pipe, the T has a larger diameter and can, can, uh, can capture more air to direct it up into the air bath. And that's, that's it. Last question, uh, poll question, Sherry. What allows modern air valves to have smaller, lighter weight valves, yet higher air flows? Last question, this is it. We have a few questions that people have asked Bill. So as soon as sure. we're done, we'll go through those and then um, let everyone do their evaluations. Great. People are still voting. So just a few more seconds. Okay, I'm closing out the voting now. Oh, a few more people in. Okay, I'm closing the voting now. And the answer is D, all of the above. Thank you, Sherry. Yep. And you mentioned there were some questions for me. Am I able to view them? Oh, I see questions. Hold on. Oh, those aren't for me. No. Um, the first one for you is, is it correct that smoother pipes would have less lesser bubbles as compared to rough pipes like concrete or the same of the same dimension. Uh, I mean, I would I, I would guess that they probably would only because of agitation of the flow. Um, the the thing that I was pointing out was that they're going to travel more quickly with the smoother pipe. Uh, I don't know that there'll be more air bubbles necessarily, but but we talked about the air pocket breaking up. I would imagine if there's a, a, a turbulence or, or you know pressure fluctuations that that air pocket getting slammed up against a rough, you know, cement lined pipe as opposed to a 401 or a, you know, a, a glass line, let's say, then if sure, it's going to, it's going to break up the pocket and introduce more air bubbles that will eventually make their way downstream to create more air pockets. Okay. The next question, do we install air valves at only high points? or can they be installed at horizontal elbows or other places? Uh, so high points are the most common 
and then the pump station valves that we discussed. Uh, according to AWWA's C5112, uh, there should be, even on a flat run of pipe, uh, if there aren't any high points, that you should have an air valve every uh, 1,500 to 2,400 feet. Um, and, and if we ever do an evaluation for somebody designing, we, we include that in our evaluation. Uh, I will point out, though, that if somebody is going to, uh, how do I put this? If, if you were to, uh, if you had 30 air valves on a, on a force main and you had to get rid of some, that would be the likely first likely candidate. Um, but, but the horizontal, uh, I didn't quite understand the horizontal part. I will say that a air valve needs to be uh, completely perpendicular to the pipe. So it needs to be, you know, upright 90 degrees, uh, well, depending on the the, you know, the angle of the pipe, but it needs to be always upright. Uh, and that's has to do with the, the, the pressure uh, rating of the valve and everything. So uh, if that answers the horizontal part, I hope. If not, we could reiterate. You can email us. Okay, the last question is, can a wastewater force main be completely blocked by air? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can name three or four instances of that in the last year that we dealt with. Uh, it's very possible. Um, I won't say that it's very likely, even though I mentioned the three or four instances. Uh, the three or four instances, two of them were on the same force main. I, you know, it tends to to be a, a matter of, of length of pump cycles, uh, what type of, of you know, what the, what's in the wastewater, I guess I could say. And, uh, and numerous factors, but it's really the topography of the pipe is number one because uh, often when we're adding on, you know, especially in, in areas like the Northeast where there's a, you know, there's not a lot of country, but there, there's, there's a, you know, additional subdivisions and things going in, we kind of piggyback onto other people's force mains. So we add force mains to force mains and it creates a lot of, you know, you know, as built one thing and designs another and it creates you know, um, unions, you know, a six inch pumping into a 24 inch and it creates all kinds of crazy uh, equations and math that, that weren't considered when the, the, the uh, pipeline was designed. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, not, not very common, but it does happen. Uh, it just seems to have happened to me in the last year more than any. Uh, but I hope that answers your question. Great. That was the last question. Um, hey. Bill, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thank you all. If anyone has any questions or issues, um, just email me. And if it's questions on the um, webinar, I can send them on to Bill and he can answer them for you. Um, or if you think of any later, um, make sure you download your certificate right now um, and the PDF of the presentation. I will also send it in a link in your follow up email tomorrow at noon. So Thank you very much, everybody, and have a wonderful day.